So I don't know how I'm supposed to follow up a live feed from Pastor Sal. <laughs> it, uh, it was way more difficult. Thank you very much. I'll follow you. It was way more difficult than you think. The, um, Sal, if you know him, is not, uh, not big on social media. I mean, he, he has an account, and if you're one of the three that are his friends, and you're fortunate. <laughs> um, and uh, so then we went to Skype, but we didn't have, that didn't work out. Then... Than, uh, than FaceTime, but he doesn't have an iPhone, he has a real phone, and uh, so we got a, finally got a bottom line is we got him, and uh, he, he's looking good, he's getting better, and uh, we definitely thank you for your prayers on that. But the really neat thing that did come out of all this is I got an opportunity to kind of sit down with him and go over the notes and, and his plan and, and what he wanted to share this evening. So I'm going to take it and we'll do it real abbreviated, real short. Uh, but we want to re- just kind of focus on what this season is all about. I, uh, I was fortunate to be able to go to the grocery store this morning, and uh, we're, uh, I was standing in the, uh, the express lane line that was like halfway across the store, and Javen says, why are we standing in this line? That line's so much shorter. I'm like, well, that person has eight items. That person has 82 items, so we'll stand behind this person. And make it happen. So we're going to talk a little bit about the nativity. How many of you guys have a nativity set at home? A few people have it set up. Uh, is it sitting on like a mantelpiece, a shelf, uh, maybe a side table? Uh, we, we got a really nice one. It's on a little shelf out of reach of most of the kids that come over uh, to our house. They can't see it. On your mantelpiece, how many of you guys have a baby Jesus? Special little baby Jesus on your, uh, on your nativity set? And a little Mary sitting or kneeling down next to her. We, most of us have that. Joseph, Joseph stands, right? Stands right there. Sometimes he has a stick. Sometimes he's standing like this. Sometimes he's looking like this. Joseph isn't too engaging in most of our nativity sets. Uh, he's probably still trying to figure this whole thing out, too. It's like, wait, I still don't know how this happened. And, uh, and it shows in there. How many of you have sheep and a shepherd on your nativity sets? I have one of those. I want to share a little bit about what the shepherds are. And we look at and we know a shepherd takes care of what? Sheep. You guys are smart. Shepherd takes care of sheep. And the shepherds actually happen to be one of the greatest characters in this whole story. And Sal shared with a little bit, the angels come to who first? The shepherds. And then the shepherds turn out to be our first evangelists. They go, they see the baby. It is just as the angels have said, and then what do they do? They go out and they start telling everybody. But it's important that we know who the shepherds were. Now, as you go through the Bible, in the early chapters, and the early books, shepherd, being a shepherd is considered a really good thing. And, and their wealth is determined by their flocks and how, much, how many animals they raise and how many they tend. And they're... As the, their flocks grow, their wealth grows, and their prestige grows. But what happened over time is the Israelites, they went into a little bit of captivity, this little place called Egypt. And as they, they start to live among these other lands, they start to adopt the mindset of the other lands. And then the Egyptians themselves looked down on shepherds. That was a dirty job. They, in some of the old Egyptian drawings, uh, the, their depictions of shepherds is not glowing. And in fact, it's a very negative light that they paint on them. When you look in the Bible, the, normally out of, in the family, what happened is the youngest child ended up watching the sheep. It was a job that was handed down. It was that dirty job that no one wants. You just keep going to the youngest one. David, in fact, is the youngest in his family. And where did they f- first find him? He was out watching sheep. So eventually, over time, being a shepherd lost its social acceptability. And as they moved into the promised land and they get this new land and, and they start to get more into agriculture and they start to develop, now watching sheep is, becoming, is more of a hassle and is not as uh, glorious. You read in some of the Jewish writings, the, the, the Mishnah, which was written in the early years, it describes shepherds as being incompetent. It even has a statement in there that says no one should feel obligated to rescue a shepherd who has fallen in a pit their views and their opinions on them. A lot of times, shepherds were deprived of regular civil rights. They could not be admitted in court as witnesses, and they literally were looked down upon. There were three classes of people 
in those times that no one wanted to be around. The first was a tax collector, for obvious reasons. The second one was the dung collector, again, obvious reasons. And then the third one was a shepherd. They were so low. Now, to be honest, being a shepherd is a very dirty job. Now, I had the privilege, I would have loved to bring a real sheep in this morning. How cool would that have been? But they are dirty. They're really dirty. We, uh, we had a couple of sheep for our live nativity. And when you think about picking up sheep and, and bringing them in, you think about this big, fluffy, white animal, right? And you're like, oh, it's, they're going to be so nice. And I get there, and it's a little rainy. Their, their stall's a little muddy. And these white sheep that I went to pick up are brown. And their fluffy coat is nasty. And when I go to grab them, it just, it's just like a big sponge of yuck. Like you leave it on your sink. These were disgusting animals. And the guy's like, look, if you would let me know a few months ago, I would have bleached out their wool. So he would have made them look good and take care of them that way. And I'm like, so they're not this glorious, fluffy, like the one on your nativity set, is it white? It's white, right? And that's what we all think with the shepherds. Now they had to take care of these sheep. Now, in some writings, and some historians believe that actually the area of the shepherds that we're talking about tonight, the shepherds out in the fields, these shepherds were raising special sheep. They weren't just raising sheep for wool. They weren't just raising sheep for food. They were raising sheep for sacrifice. And the sheep that they were raising in this area were meant for a very special purpose. So this puts the shepherds in a very unique position. In order to sacrifice a sheep, the sheep had to be without blemish. It had to be perfect. That means the wool had to be white. That means it had to look a certain way. It had to carry itself a certain way. It, had to be, uh, it couldn't be too old. It had to be healthy. Now, a lot of these shepherds are taking care of what could be thousands of sheep. And if you're taking care of sheep that are going to end up being someone's sacrifice, someone's going to essentially picturesque, they're going to transfer their sins over to this animal. This animal has to at least look perfect and you have a thousand sheep, is that work? That's work. That means you've got to, you're going to try to keep them clean. That means he's going to interact with them on a level that someone who's raising them for meat is not. So you start to develop a bond with these animals. Anyone have pets at home? My wife, we have two dogs. I convinced her to get a second one. She reminds me every day. She's not an animal person, but eventually over time she developed a bond with the animals, right? It happens. They stick around, you start developing a bond. The, the shepherds are the same way. They're, they're spending so much time trying to protect these sheep that they're developing a bond. Maybe they're even naming them. What would you name a sheep? Maybe Barbara, right? Maybe that one over there could be Ben. Or maybe a nice Jewish name like Abraham, right? So they're taking care of these sheep and they're developing a really close relationship with the sheep. And then the week of Passover comes. Now, in order for a shepherd to make his money, he has to sell these sheep. It's, that's how he keeps his living. He can't hang on to them. They have to go. And every single person that comes to get a sheep from him during this time of the year is doing it for one reason. That animal is going to die and is going to pay for that person's sins. And he has this relationship with this animal, and he has this literally being torn away from him to death. So when the angels come to the shepherds, they're doing two things. One, God's saying, look, there is no one too low for this announcement. There is no one too low for this king. And the second thing, these shepherds know what sacrifice is. They know what a savior is. They know who God is. In Psalm 19.1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and in the sky above proclaim his handiwork. Where are the shepherds living? They're out in the open. They don't have big barns. They're, not, they're shuttling them from field to field. They're locking them in at night in, a, in an open field. They see the glory of God every day. They know there's a God. So when the angels come to them, and they say, Look, for unto you, in Luke 2.11, For unto you is born this day the city of David a Savior. The shepherds know, and they understand what a Savior means. They know their needs, and they know the significance of this. Now, the other thing we have going on in our nativity, some people do. How many people have wise men at your nativity? Don't raise your hand, don't raise your hand, don't raise your hand. 
we'll share with you in a little bit why. Anyone who knows, uh, been around the church for a while, we, we know the, the, the significance of the wise men. The wise men actually weren't at the nativity scene. Uh, there actually were probably more than just three of them. In Matthew 2, chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, the wise men, this is nearly two years after, said, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. They said, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star, and when it rose, have come to worship him. So what are the wise men? The wise men are magi. They're seekers. They're learners. They're, they're, the, the, they're literally the, the, the smartest people you would think of being around. They tend to, to be astrologers. These wise men, it is assumed, come from, from Babylon. If you think about Babylon, and you go through the history of Babylon, you go on back, you go to a point where Daniel, and we'll remember the story Daniel and the lion's den. Remember Daniel and his men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and a group of individuals. Daniel was a very prominent person in the land of Babylon. So we can safely assume that over time, he starts, Daniel has an influence over these wise men. Now the wise men in general, they're out there, they're studying. They're, 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 they tend to be rich, they tend to be well-to-do. They tend to live in very lavish houses. They have very uh, lavish uh, clothing. They, they're almost considered like kings. You know, we three kings, they're, they're looked upon in such a way. So they're studying the stars. And we all know what happens when Jesus is born, what shows up in the sky. A star, right? And they, they're astrologers. They, they've seen the patterns, they see what's going on, and then something pops up in the dif- distance that they have not seen before. And now they're going to try to figure out, why did this thing just show up? What is going on with this? And we can assume that through all their studies and what's been handed down generation to generation, they start to remember, you know what, there were some writings in the Old Testament. There's some writings in the Old Testament that a star would appear. In fact, in Numbers 24, 17, it says, A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Because they're coming through this line of Daniel, they're not just astrologers. They're also, they also know a little bit of the Old Testament. So they're starting to put two and two together, saying, you know what? That star's there for a reason, and it's special. And some of them decide, you know what, let's go find out what's going on with this star. Let's see where this star leads us. They traveled nearly 800 miles. Now, 800 miles today is, is a long ways. But 800 miles then is an incredibly long ways. They have to give up. You know, they're, they're living in, in a nice little palace, nice little mansion. They have to give that up and travel to this dinky little town. And traveling is not easy. It's dirty. It costs a lot of money. It's not like they just got in and, and traveled themselves. They're, they're bringing their, their entourage, their group with them, their servants, the people who are helping them out. They're bringing this whole group. It is a big to-do when they're coming out. And when the wise men, when the magi get there, they have gifts. What do they have? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Good, you guys have read this before. I'm very excited. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And depending on what you read over time, they'll start to say, well, the gold represents this. The, the frankincense represents The myrrh represents it. You know what the gifts represent? They were common gifts given to royal birth. They brought gifts for a prince, for a king. That's, their mindset was, we're going to go to this king. But I think the greatest thing, when they got there, they're going through this whole, these travels. It took, them, it took them weeks. From the time they saw the star and they got there, it took them years to find this baby Jesus. And in Matthew 2, 11, what I think is the greatest gift that they gave, it says, going into the house, they saw the child with him, Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. They went on this trip. They didn't know that they were going to find him. They weren't guaranteed. They didn't have a GPS. They punch it in, and eventually they'll end up there. They just knew if they head in this direction, there's a good chance they may find it. In fact, they went to the current King Herod, and they said, hey, here's what's going on. Here's all the information we have. Do you know where this king is, where this baby's being born? Expecting Herod to know what's going on in his own kingdom. And Herod said, oh, I don't know. But when you find him, let me know. Now, we've come to find out that the God intervenes there. They don't go back and tell King Herod. So the shepherds 
at the bottom of the barrel, so to speak, received an announcement straight from the angel, straight from the Lord himself, reveals and it says this is what's going on. The wise men up in their palace, in their castles, in their fancy homes, in their well-to-do life, see a sign, put two and two together, and realize there's a king out there that we need to find. And if you keep reading down in Luke, you get past the story, towards the end of chapter two, you find out there's, there's a, a priest named Simeon and a prophetess named Anna, who God had promised you will see this. So even some of the religious, some of the religious leaders of the time were waiting for him. Here's the bottom line. We can all find Jesus. It doesn't matter where we come from, where we start from. You can find Jesus if you're living in the White House, hopefully. You can find Jesus in the White House. You can find Jesus in prison. You can find Jesus in the back alleys. In your darkest times, you can find Jesus. In your best of times, you can find Jesus. Regardless of your place, he's out there to be found. But here's the deal. The, the issue is not the announcement. Everyone knows this story. We've heard this story before. The deal is how do you respond to this announcement? Now, if I got an invitation to go hear Bon Jovi in concert, some of you would jump on that. For me, it means nothing. Luxury box, get the VIP pass, go in the back, you'd see him. Someone invite, I wouldn't go. I have no interest in going to that. But someone says, hey, I got tickets to a Lakers game. Nosebleeds, got to pay for parking. I'm in. The value isn't in the invitation. It's in how it's received. It's, it's what's going on in, in your life. The Magi went to King Herod, and you can imagine they're sitting around a table, and he's wondering, why are all these important people coming into my town? What's going on here? And they share with him. They lay it out and say, look, this, this is what we've seen happen over the past couple years. This star, believe it or not, King, this star has actually moved, and we're tracing it. We're following it. And in the Old Testament, it says a star will appear, and we start reading in Isaiah, and it says, look, there's a baby that's going to be born here, and he's going to be king of the Jews, and he's going to rule forever, it says. Herod got the same information. The Magi went to worship, and King Herod wanted to kill him. Same invitation, very different response. The angels came to the shepherds. The shepherds, it says the shepherds ran to find this baby. We can assume not every shepherd went. It didn't say all of them went. So some stayed behind. Every year we hear this story. If you show up at church Christmas Eve, you're going to hear the story about the baby. And it's sitting out there. The invitation is sitting out there for you. What are you going to do with it? That's up to you. An announcement's being made. The shepherds realize their need for a Savior. They could hear the cries of their sheep as they're being sacrificed, praying there's got to be something better than this. The kings, these wise men, these kings, this, this royalty, they knew there was something better out there. They knew they needed a king that was greater than them. The best thing that happened, though, was God came down to be a man, to live with us. The Christ child, Jesus Christ, has been born for you and for me, to live a perfect life, to pay for our sins. And it really doesn't matter if you come to him as a shepherd or if you come to him as a king. The bottom line, he can still be your savior. And Luke 2, 11 says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we cannot thank you enough for your son. God, we can't begin to comprehend what it is to give up everything to come live as one of us, to live perfect so that we can have eternal life with you. God, there's some in this room who don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior. God, just don't let them leave here without at least asking the question, who is this Jesus? God, there's some here that know you but have not been living a life that celebrates you. God, maybe today is the day they make that turn. 
And God, there are those here who love you and are serving you wholeheartedly. God, may they influence those around them. May they see people come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. We thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for this season. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your love. And thank you for life, God. It's your great, holy, awesome name we pray. Amen.